dear friends. I hope you enjoyed that little ditty. If you'd like to hear it played properly, it's called Elisa and it's from the film of the same name. Anyway, I'd like to do another reading from Deja Vu, which incidentally is receiving brilliant reviews worldwide. This reading carries on from where our novel reading number one left off. You may recall that Alex had had one hell of a session with Anna. Reclining like an overindulged sultan, he excessively enjoyed the fruits of her labours. However, now wishing to bring events to a satisfying conclusion, so to speak, he begins to realise that everything is not exactly as how he had imagined. Here goes. Alex knew he was beaten. Gazumped. She'd been going at it hell for leather forever, for all time, and still he was thwarted, he was stretched to his limit, her pussy was attached to his prick like a limpet, a slippery clam that wouldn't let go. He needed to come, urgently. He kept feeling like he was going to, but he couldn't. Every time he got near, the feeling cut out, she had him trapped on the edge suspended on the brink, on the brink of ecstasy, yet a billion light years from it. If she didn't allow him to release soon, he was going to erupt in an explosion of gory oblivion. Oh, come on, please, please. But he knew her game, knew what she was up to. He'd seen through her scheme, her diabolical scheme. It was obvious. She was paying him back for all the rebuffs he had dealt her. That was it. The bitch had spiked his drink earlier. She slipped in a spiteful potion and the said had come and he was going. He was going to die. He knew it. There was no doubt about it. If he didn't come soon or get her off him, he was going to be extinguished, snuffed out like a job on fag end. He attempted to push her away, but the strength in his arms had already gone. He tried again, but it was futile. He was at her mercy. His life was in her hands. Through remorseful tears, he stared up into the mirror. And still she was grinding him, power driving him into oblivion. Grown men don't cry. But he could not stop. He could not staunch the flow of tears, hot scalding tears that were cascading down his face. And in his ruin, he saw that her hips had become as rotund as Catherine's. He saw the cheeks of her ass, a fleshy, metronomic jaw, counting down the death nail blows to his demise. I don't want to die. His words emerged from his mouth like a crybaby's blubber. Spittle ran down his chin. I've always meant well. I love you, Alec. His manhood seemed ready to explode, to split like a busted banana. Oh, please, please, I won't do it again. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. And it was then that it happened. At the extremis of his woes, at the point when he thought that nothing worse could happen, absolutely nothing on earth worse, when he knew that shortly he would face his maker, that the transmogrification occurred. It wasn't over. She was still going at it full tilt and he could still feel the clutch of her female parts. But in that dreadful, 
awful, dire moment, her flesh simply melted away, dripped like candy wax from her bones, and he saw that he was being ridden by a skeleton. Alec shot bolt upright in his bed. Anna! He cried the name of his nocturnal visitor, his succubus. Anna! He shouted it again and again. Anna! And in that brief post-nightmare moment, the clutch of her female parts remained with him, and he knew that he could. In fact, he knew that he was going to. In a little while, grown cold in the bedtime heat, using his free arm, he scooped himself out of bed and made off for the en suite. What a dream! What a bloody fabulous dream! He would need a hand job for a week. Well, there you are, dear friends. It was all a dream. And Alex remains faithful to Catherine, at least for the time being. But what about Catherine, alone and isolated in Cornwall? Will she manage to sink Christopher Armstrong's dastardly plans for her seduction? I'll leave you to find out. So until we meet again, dear friends, I wish you all lots and lots of raunchy reading. Au revoir.